humble pranams at the lotus feet of Bhagwan Baba, respected elders, <coughs> dear brothers and sisters, a warm welcome to all to the Sri Satya Sai Aradhana Mahotsavam. This is the sacred day on which all of us jointly offer our gratitude to our beloved Bhagwan, who is always with us, in us, around us, above us, and below us. But yet acknowledging the difficulty that humans have in experiencing this omnipresent form of God, with all his love and compassion, he chose to make himself available to us in his gross physical form that we call the avatar. The infinite chooses to manifest in a finite form, in flesh and blood, a form that we can see, we can hear, and we can touch. God exists in multiple dimensions. Each one experiences God according to his or her own sense of perception. Just to illustrate the point, let us take the example of a wall. A layman who sees a wall sees it as a solid and opaque block of brick and mortar and nothing less. But when a scientist sees the wall, he sees vast emptiness and a few molecules and atoms which constitute an infinitesimally small part of the space. And when a philosopher sees the wall, he believes it is an illusion and a temporary manifestation of energy patterns. And eventually, when a saint sees the wall, he says, this is God. In a similar manner, Bhagwan walked amidst us in flesh and blood for over eight decades, and we basked in the glory of his beautiful and most enchanting form. We perhaps get so attached to the physical dimension of his existence that when he chooses to phase out this particular dimension, we find it very challenging to refocus on the other dimensions of his existence. However, again, in his divine mercy and compassion, he has been manifesting his omnipresence in multifarious ways across the globe, much more intensely than ever before, just to reassure us of his continuing eternal existence amidst us. The last one year has been tough for many of us, perhaps most of us, in our attempt to refocus the lens of our mind to tune into Bhagwan's subtler dimensions of eternal existence. This journey from the form to the formless is no doubt a profound one, but at the same time a very challenging one too. As we approach one year on this journey of rediscovery and retuning, it would be very apt to pause, benefit and reflect from the experiences of some very senior devotees and eminent personalities to understand and appreciate their insights on this transition from the form to the formless. It is with this objective that we have organized a colloquium today, wherein we will listen to few eminent speakers speaking about their experiences on this journey from the form to the formless. We have two speakers in the morning and one in the evening. The valediction of the colloquium will be held day after tomorrow on the 25th in the evening. We are very fortunate to have with us today Dr. Samuel Sandweis from San Diego, California, United States of America, Swami Suddhananda Giri from the Yogoda Satsanga Society of India, and Sri J. Jairaman from Sri Ramanashramam. The first speaker this morning is Dr. Samuel Sandweis, who will introduce the theme of the colloquium in detail and will also share his experiences with us. Dr. Samuel Sandweis, MD, is an eminent practicing psychiatrist for over 40 years. He currently resides in San Diego, California, USA. He has been the medical director of a psychiatric clinic and has taught at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine in the position of assistant clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry. He has been a consultant to the Dialysis and Kidney Transplantation Program at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine, and has consulted with geriatric programs and with hospice. 
Dr. Sandweis has been interested in the relationship between spirituality and psychiatry and how spiritual practices affect the mind and expand consciousness and love. Dr. Sandweis had the privilege to come into Bhagwan's fold way back in the early 1970s. He is the author of three very famous books on Bhagwan Baba, Sai Baba, The Holy Man and the Psychiatrist, Spirit and the Mind, and the recently published With Love, Man is God. Dr. Sandweis has also served on the Satya Sai Baba Council of the United States since its inception in 1975. He and his wife Sharon have hosted a Sai Baba Center in their home in San Diego for over 38 years and they oversee the birthday publishing company which publishes books about Baba written by Western authors. I now welcome Dr. Samuel Sandweis to come over and share his thoughts with us. Dr. Samuel Sandweis. Dearest, beloved Swami, who is omnipresent and always with us, who fills this hall with love and the entire universe with love, I pray that your love comes through these words so that we have your darshan. Respected members of revered ashrams of sacred India, respected elders, brothers and sisters, how happy I am to be here with you today, gathered as a family with Swami, feeling his presence, feeling one in his love. Swami has told us that even though we look different, he says, I say I, you say I, he says I, she says I, all seem different in physical appearance, but all are one in the experience of I. Yes, we are all one in the I of Sai. This is a very auspicious time as we reflect on a passing of something that does not come or go. What brings us here is a form that is formless, a light that dissolves differences and unites us in love. Today the topic is experiencing the divine from form to formless, giving me opportunity to reflect on Swami's omnipresence. Omnipresence means that he's always with us, ever providing and protecting, and that we can be with him in his various forms or formless whenever we turn to him. He can appear to us in any way he wills. Swami has left his physical body, but is still with us in many forms. Dreams, visions, vibhuti, visitations, a sense of his presence. In his universal form, he can be found in all beings and is manifesting in all world religions and traditions in their forms of worship. And in the formless, my understanding of the formless is infinite silence, eternal peace, emptiness of desires and attachments, pure love, which is everything, everything. Swami has given us what scientists have been seeking for years, the theory of everything, summed up in his seemingly simple Advaitic statement, Everything is nothing, and nothing is everything. There is no separation, only one, and that one is everything. That one is love. Love is the basis, the cause of all causes. This is the vision into the core of creation and the path of peace. Swami once described this state to me. Everything is coming out of you, he said, and then holding my shirt pocket open, he added, 
And when everything comes out, Swami jumps in, and Swami dove his fingers into my pocket. Swami not only tells us that he's ever present when we turn to him, he also tells us why he is with us. It is to awaken us from the dream, from our attachment to physical body and sensory world, so that consciousness soars into the region of oneness with him, pure love. He comes to help us realize, and this is Swami's quote, what exists is only the perceiver of both the dream and waking state. That is the I. Know that I and know that I is the same as God. Swami helps, comes to help us realize that self is God. As the Bhajan goes, I am God, I am God, I am no different from God. I am love, I am truth, I am peace eternally. I am Satchitananda Swarupa. And Swami not only tells us why divinity is with us in form and formless, but also how to come to him. A quote, know the I, the self, can only be achieved through intense spiritual discipline devoid of anger, envy, and greed. Eliminating anger, envy, and greed. The purification of the mind through upholding dharma. The practice of love. This is the highest spiritual discipline that reveals our divine self. Swami once asked what I would like, and I said, you, Swami, not knowing exactly what I was asking for, only knowing that being with Swami was the source of my highest happiness. Take me, I'm yours, he said, holding his arms out as if hugging the universe. But who am I? I'm not this body, these feelings, thoughts, mind, I'm not intellect, not bliss, then who am I? Yes, who am I? That is the question to consider today. And the answer is found in Swami's omnipresent love. By turning to him, by practicing his teachings of love and service, his teachings of love we enter into him. Love all as you love me, he says, and realize that the answer to the question, who am I, is so hum, so hum, so hum, I am he, I am he, I am he. Omnipresence. I personally have experienced Swami's omnipresence most intensely when doing his work. For instance, my wife and I have hosted a Sai Baba Center in our home for over 38 years. Involvement with Swami's devotional, educational, and service activities over these years has had a deep effect on my inner life. Developing this kind of close relationship, bringing him into all activities, while releasing consequences and selfishness, makes the connection profoundly personal. One of my friends was so taken with Swami's personal love that clinging to his feet, he cried out, Oh, Swami, oh, Swami, I love you so much. I want you to be my personal Swami, only for me. And Swami replied, I am your personal Swami. I am everyone's personal Swami. A story. He is omnipresent, so look for him. Find him everywhere and in everyone and find our real self, the story. One day as a young psychiatrist, I was called to see a patient in the locked unit of a psychiatric hospital. He was a middle-aged, wasted and weathered man who was picked up on the streets in a confused state. He had not bathed for days, was incoherent, dirty, and reeked of an awful odor what to do with such a man. He had been burned over 70% of his body, with most of his ears, eyelids, and nose burned off. You could see the holes in the front of his face where his nose once was. Unsightly scars deformed his body and con contracted his hands. I thought, how can he stand to be in such a body? I wanted to leave. Then I remembered, this must be Swami. 
I reminded myself that if Swami were to come to me, he could do it to show me my weakness, my inability to see him in everyone. My God, this tortured soul must be Swami, I thought. The strange thing was that not only did I think that this tortured soul was Swami, I had a strange inner feeling much deeper than thought that this person actually was Swami. For an instant, I experienced wonderful transformation of my feeling and thinking. I liked this man. I wanted to be in his presence. I looked deeply into his eyes to see if I could see Swami, and I thought I could. I looked at his deformed lips trying to make out Swami's smile, and I thought I could. I wanted a smile from him. I wanted to do my best for him. Remembering Swami brought awareness of his teachings about Satya Dharma Shante Prema Ahimsa. I wanted this patient to have peace. I didn't want to ignore him in any way. When I came to see him every day, I thought I was having darshan of Swami. Remembering Swami transformed me into my real self. How could this transformation come about when mind turns to the master do we align ourselves with mere mental memory or with an indescribable power beyond mind that is capable of turning bondage to liberation? My story about the power of remembering the master does not prove that we are actually connected to divine energy, but the achievements of Swami's devotees inspired by his love are of such reach and radiance that this expanded expression of love is strong evidence that we are aligning ourselves with something all-powerful and beyond mind. We are all aware of the temples of healing providing free care, cardiac, neurologic, orthopedic, eye, and more. Eleven million people in severe drought-stricken areas in India receive free, clean drinking water daily. The wonderful Sri Satya Sai Institute of Higher Learning providing free education to thousands of sterling students. Not only here in India, but worldwide are blossoming institutions of Swami's love. Award-winning projects like the Miracle School of Victor Kanu in Zambia, Africa, where disturbed children are transformed into shining examples of character and productivity. To the medical camps in Russia and beyond. Disaster response teams dispatching flood and earthquake areas. Food and clothing distributed world worldwide. Values-based education programs emerging all over the world. Swami assures us that our connection with him is more than mortal or mental. It is a direct channel to divinity beyond time and death. We are his instruments of love. And there's no greater expression of Swami's divinity than the wisdom he has showered on us. In discourses and books, Swami enlightens us about the lives of avatars like Rama and Krishna and others, told in the first person. Spiritual texts like Gita, Mahabharata, Bhagavata, and others told in exciting detail and with new insights the brilliant teachings of the Vahinis, and much, much more, all bringing understanding of unparalleled clarity and revealing Swami's divinity. Swami can expound on the most esoteric teachings, the chakras, kundalini, mantras, meditation, pranayam, but the highest spiritual practice, he says, is virtue. It is the practice of love that upholds dharma and brings happiness to all. Swami clarifies how dharma purifies mind and uplifts society. The subtlest impurities of mind are exposed when we interact together in service with the attitude of detachment from consequence. By turning inward, identifying and then releasing selfishness, ego, lust, anger, etc., the mind enters into the heart where it finds Bliss and love. This is the path to perfecting culture and to world peace. Today, miracles are still happening in abundance, and many of us are sensing his intimate guidance while we do his work. I personally have experienced no greater example of his omnipresent guidance than the following event 
that began 29 years ago and is still continuing. This is the story. It's a story about how Swami is always guiding and protecting us and can manifest himself to us at any time, in any way, in any way he wills. Even to me in San Diego, California, 12,000 miles from his physical form. Early in our relationship, Swami told me that he would come in my practice of psychiatry. I thought perhaps he would help me understand more deeply how holding to virtues and values affect our emotional growth far more than is understood by Western science. Shortly thereafter, in 1983, something unusual happened. A young Western Caucasian woman patient of mine with no prior knowledge of Sanskrit, knew nothing about Hinduism, all of a sudden began speaking Sanskrit out of the blue. One day she told me that Swami was visiting her while she was in a dreamlike state and talking to her in a strange language. Of course, initially I thought this was imagination and an attempt to gain attention with her unusual story. I told Jackie, the patient, that if she was visited again and could remember the strange words to call my answering machine and record them for me. How surprised I was when two days later I heard this young sp patient, naive patient, speaking Sanskrit like a scholar on my answering machine tape. Here was my young disabled patient speaking a language she had no way of knowing. I was dumbfounded. What was the meaning of this occurrence outside the understanding of modern science? Was this contact with Swami as he had promised? Jackie said the visitor was Swami and he was giving a message to believers. Not only was Jackie able to recall the Sanskrit, she was able to write it down phonetically and even more surprisingly, she was able to translate it for me. As the event unfolded, Vibhuti and Amrita began appearing on her pictures in her Christian Bible and on her body. I immediately picked up a video camera and began recording. Years later, when I had time to deal with the video, a student of Sanskrit helped me decipher the messages. Jackie identifies Swami as the speaker and said that Swami referred to himself as Parabrahman, the boundless, the imperishable. Here Swami was coming to me through the sickest of my patients, and he was saying and declaring, I am Parabrahman, your director. The impact was that a young psychiatrist sitting in his office 12,000 miles away is told by his sickest patient in Sanskrit that I am the boundless, the imperishable, I am your guru, guru, I am your director in our yajna, our yajna to bring heaven on earth. For me to sit in a interview room with my Western patient and to hear Swami coming through the patient like this gave me a vision into Swami's omnipresence and extension beyond time and death and place that will never leave me that he is always with us and can extend any place. I wanted you to have the concrete experience of seeing the patient, how sick she was, and to see us decipher the notes line by line, showing how Swami can come to you any way. Profound insights of Vedanta flowed from the mouth of a disabled, naive Western patient, a leela of the highest order. The refrain found in almost all the messages was, whatever form, a divine being wills to be, that form the divine being becomes. Swami had literally and concretely appeared in my psychiatric practice. Whatever Swami wills, will happen. Just like he willed us not to see this clip. All of it is his, and we have to say yes, yes, it's better this way, it's wonderful this way, it's Swami's will. There is much, much more to the video, too much to play and describe here, describing Swami in various forms. These declarations of his forms keep pouring out of my, my 
patient's mouth. Here are some of the descriptions translated from Sanskrit. Believer, it starts always with, oh great believer. And I know that this is not only addressed to me, but it's addressed to you. I could never play this to a non-believer. They would never understand it. I am the boundless, a non-beating sound, anahata sabda. I am Sai Baba. I am Daivi Prakriti, the electrical energy in the universe of manifestations. All this from my patient coming out of her mouth. Charity of love immortal, Danya. I am Buddha of light. I am truth. There is no religion higher than truth. I am Sai Baba, your director in our yagna. I am your director for gaining heaven on earth. At one point, Jackie the patient told me, he told me that I am he and he is me. I don't know what that means. He just told me that. When I asked Jackie if Sai Baba would cure her, she said that he told her, he is not here to cure everyone. We must take part in the healing. Why is he here, I asked. She said, bottom line, for love. She, this patient who knew nothing of Swami, was filled with his love and said, it's love, it's love, it's love, that's why he's here. As the event unfolded, I strongly felt that this poor suffering patient represented the suffering of Mother Earth due to our mindless, selfish behavior that is causing great harm. When I saw her twisted face and her seizures, I could see that this is what Mother Earth is doing. She is crying and, and seizing and in pain and suffering and saying, children, children, help me, help me now. We must take responsibility in the healing to relieve the suffering of Mother Earth. It's important to remember that we are in a holy yajna with Swami, sacrificing selfishness and narrow-mindedness through the power of love to establish a better world. Where do we go from here? I describe the case of my Sanskrit-speaking patient as a concrete example of Swami being beyond time and space. And because I think it has relevance to science and to our understanding of consciousness and love, I encourage all scientists, scientists, to likewise describe in the literature their experiences of miracles of love. And all brothers and sisters to propagate the teaching of love and truth aligned with local customs and traditions, aligned with local customs and traditions so they understand, knowing that we are instruments of our common master of love. Yes, we can sing in a variety of tunes from various traditions as we're doing here today, and with clear vision of the unity in the apparent diversity. That unity is love, love, love. Swami has described the greatness of the spiritual giants from all the different traditions. A quote from Swami, Yana, or ultimate wisdom, can be won from and through elders who have experienced the absolute. Serve them and win their love. Then can this precious Yana be won. Here Swami embraces all great teachers who have experienced the absolute. His is not exclusive love, it's all-inclusive love, experiencing divinity from form to formless. The theme of this colloquium is to experience and celebrate Swami's all-embracing love in all its various forms and formless that bring us together as one family. On a personal note, I deeply miss Swami's physical body. For many of us, just resting our eyes on that glorious form revealed all of creation and beyond, a mystical sight. Like what Mother Yashoda saw in young Krishna's mouth, I miss his personality, his smile, and I have shed tears. But as I serve, I have felt Swami's presence even stronger since he has left his physical body. I visualize him in my mind's eye more easily, feel his presence more intensely, see him as light, feel his protective guidance in my efforts to propagate his message of love in writing and video. I feel him in the people with whom I serve and the opportunities that have ar arisen, like being invited here today 
to speak to you at this auspicious event. It was an, for me an invitation directly from Swami, and I see him filling this hall. And most importantly, I feel his grace allowing me to release fear, anxiety, suffering, and obstacles into his infinite peace. My wife once asked Swami if he would save the world. He answered, half save, half seva, love in action. We have work to do. In closing, I embrace all of you and call on Swami. Let your glory shine on our hearts like a million suns, setting our love aflame until you and I become the same. Let us walk with your love in our hearts, your name on our lips, your hand in ours, and hand in hand, half save, half save us. Let us bring honor to your sacred name and radiate love to the world so that the mountains ring with love, the heavens sing with love, the stars shine with love, the poets rhyme with love, and all the beings of all the worlds are happy. J. Sairam. The second and final speaker for the morning session of the colloquium is Swami Suddhananda Giri, Swami Suddhananda Giri graduated as an electrical engineer from IIT Madras in 1975. He then joined the Baba Atomic Research Center in Mumbai. A man of deep scientific insight, after serving in Bach for five years as a part of the team conducting research on plasma physics, he felt the inner call to give up his worldly pursuits and dedicate his life as a monastic disciple of Sri Sri Paramahamsa Yogananda. We know Sri Sri Paramahamsa Yogananda very well as the author of the spiritual classic Autobiography of a Yogi and the founder of the Yogoda Satsanga Society of India. Yogoda Satsanga Society is a spiritual and charitable organization that has as its objective the dissemination of the scientific teachings of Raja Yoga. Since 1980, Swami Sudhananda Giri has been a board member of the Yogoda Satsanga Society, administrator of Dakshineshwar Ashram Vyasis. He now serves as a treasurer of the Yogoda Satsanga Society of India. He has been living in the Yogoda Satsanga Ashrams at Ranchi, Dakshineshwar and Noida. He has traveled all over India and abroad in order to disseminate the how to live and Kriya Yoga teachings of Sri Sri Paramahamsa Yogananda. I now request Swami Suddhananda Giri to come over and share his thoughts with us. Swami Suddhananda Giri. Let us close our eyes for a few moments and give our devotion to the Guru of all Gurus. Brahmanandam Paramasukadam Kevalam Jnana Murtim Dvandvatitam Gagana Sadrisham Tatvamasyadi Lakshyam Yekam Nityam Vimalam Machalam Sarvadhi Sakshi Bhutam Bhavati Tam Triguna Rahitam Sadgurum Tam Namami Sadgurum Tam Namami Sadgurum Tam Namami I also request all of you, please fold your hands, close your eyes, 
concentrate at the kutastha, the brumadhya, visualize Bhagavan in various aspects to be present, and please repeat after me. O Father of all fathers, Mother of all mothers, the friend behind all friends, my beloved God, the Guru of all Gurus, saints of all religions, we humbly bow to you all. Hey Priya Bhagavan, Bless me, Bless me. That, I will lead my life that I may lead my life with you in my heart, with, you in my heart. with a smile on my face, with a smile on my face. And, let my hands and let my hands work ungrudgingly, work ungrudgingly. For, truth alone. for truth alone. Om Shanti. 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 Jai Guru and Sai Ram to all of you, my dear brothers and sisters. Greetings to all of you from the sacred Yogoda Satsanga ashrams of Paramahamsa Yoganandaji with the main hub at Ranchi. As many of you may be aware, Paramahamsa Yoganandji was the last in the line of Yogoda Gurus. The Guru Parampara leading back to Swami Sri Yukteswarji, Lahiri Mahashayaji and Mahavatar Babaji. In the world today, with its many tamasic influences, the blessings of saintly lives that are wholly dedicated to bringing divine light and love into the world as seen in all the great ones that have blessed India in modern times are an absolute necessity and a divine blessing to the whole world, helping to maintain the balance of spiritual vibrations in our very troubled time and helping the world on its upward evolution. The very noble, charitable, and social services that are an ongoing legacy of Sri Satya Sai Baba will continue to touch the hearts of many. Such a life inspires us all to live for others and serve the divine in them through acts of seva in body, mind, and spirit. Today, we will focus on the theme of experiencing the divine with form and without form. In our context, it is also relevant to dwell on the ongoing presence and blessings of a great master or a true guru that can be experienced by his disciples and followers. Accordingly, I will divide the task into two portions concentrating on these two aspects. First, let us take Bhagavad Gita, 7th chapter, 24th sloka. Sat number adhyay, chaubis number sloka. Avyaktam, vyaktim apannam, manyante maam abuddhaya, param bhavam, param bhavam ajananto, Mama avyayam anuttamam. Men without wisdom, abuddhaya. Consider me, the unmanifest avyaktam, as assuming embodiment, like a mortal being taking form, not understanding my unsurpassable state, param, my unchangeable, that is avyayam, unutterable nature, anuttamam. 
Sri Sri Paramahamsa Yogananda, my Gurudev, he explains this in the spiritual treatise, God Talks with Arjuna, as follows. As unseen vapor can be condensed into water and frozen into an iceberg, so the invisible, impersonal God can be projected into a form by devotion's frost and worshipped as a personality. However, a devotee is foolish to think if he limits God to that form and forgets his omnipresence. A great master, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, who saw God constantly as Mother Kali, conversing often with her, later said, I had to destroy that finite form of my mother with the sword of wisdom to behold her as the formless infinite. Many devotees in India, for instance, limit the conceptions of Godhead to images of Krishna. They put an idol to sleep under sheets on the altar at night and awaken it by singing chants before it in the morning, placing the image in a standing position on the altar. They lay food and fruits in front of the idol each morning and evening, a symbolic act of feeding it. If a devotee performs such worship with sincere devotion, of course, God receives the spirit of love behind the offering. But a devotee who makes the worship too personal obliterates the thought of God's impersonal, all-pervading nature. He who worships God merely as a finite form will not attain the transcendental divine union with his infinite nature. God once whispered through Paramahamsa Yogananda for the benefit of all, all of us. God says, to the devotional call of the child of mine who struggles, prays, and meditates in order to know me in body, mind, and soul as all-pervading, ever-new joy, as the ever-increasing bliss of meditation, I silently and deeply respond. So this is God's assurance to all of us. We are, when we are struggling, praying, meditating, and trying to feel the presence of the divine, sometimes you may think that God is not responding. <laughs> but God's assurance is, I silently and deeply respond, which may, be, may not be immediately perceptible. So, formless worship can be tangible too. <laughs> Only when you worship in form, it is tangible. It is not so. Even when you worship formless form, aspect of God, still it can be very tangible. Just like worshipping in form or even deeper. As doctor explained little while before, consonating on love. Love has got no form. Love is formless. But it can be tangibly felt. <laughs> it is more real than the form. Sri Sri Dayamata, who was the third president of Yogada Satsanga Society of India, after Mahasamadhi of Param Yogananda, Rajashi Janakananda was the president, then Dayamata ji became the president. She served for many, many years, from 1955 till last year, 2010. And she was taken to temples in near, Karna, in near Bangalore, temples in South India, during her visits in 1960s. Ma had visited India five times. During one of those visits, she was taken to the temples. Her spiritual counsel to the devotees while visiting temples, very beautifully, Ma said, when we visit the temples, what should we do? First, through the image, go beyond the image. Don't limit it just to the image, whether we are worshipping in the form of Hanuman, or Ram, or Krishna, or Kali, Durga, Krishna, Ganesh, doesn't matter. Whatever aspect of God, you are focusing on that form. But don't limit yourself to that form. Through the form, go beyond the form. Feel the omnipresence of that divinity. Second, sit quietly and absorb the divine vibrations, spiritual vibrations of that place. We have a custom, isn't it? My father used to take me when I was small to the temples and he used to tell me, always you should sit for some time and then come. <laughs> I used to do it as a formality. <laughs> 
because my father told me I just sit there for a few minutes and then just go. <laughs> but then the real reason is given by Ma here, beloved Ma, that is absorb the spiritual vibrations of that place. When we do any worship by chanting, by bhajans, in various ways, arati, after that, you should just sit quietly and the vibrations generated, you should absorb it in your consciousness. So that is why, I mean, this is the advice given by Ma. So that explains very nicely how we go from form to the formless. So now let us dwell on the second aspect, that is how the Guru's blessings and guidance continue even after he leaves the body. So I will quote from our own example, followers of Param Yogananda, how we have felt. Because that will help all of you who are also in a similar situation. When Param Yogananda entered Mahasamadhi in 1952, 7th March, it was felt as if it is a world calamity. That dear form is no longer now available. We cannot have darshan of Guruji. So then many devotees thought, what will happen now? This was expressed by Dayamadaji herself to Guruji directly a few days before his Mahasamadhi. Guruji, if when you leave the form, how can we carry on? You are the focus and if you are not there, the organization will collapse. But Guruji, very, with a sweet smile and humility, just told her, when I am gone, only love can take my place. And carry on in that love, with that love, then there is absolutely no problem. And that's what we are experiencing. 60 years have gone now. <laughs> 1952 Mahasamadhi, Paramahams Yogananjis, 60 years have gone. And we see in the ever increasing way the blessings and guidance of the great ones. They are available to the whole humanity. Sri Sri Minali Mata, who is the current president, the fourth president, said that, Thousands met Param Yogananji while he was in body. But all of them did not realize the true nature and spiritual stature and follow his teachings. She added that many of many among our generation who never saw Guruji in physical form are far more benefited by proper attunement. So what is required is attunement with the Guru not just worshipping him in only physical form. In one of her recent letters, Manali Mataji wrote to devotees all over the globe, recalling the 60th anniversary of Mahasamadhi anniversary of Param Shivakananji. She said, though devotees have passed, though decades have passed since that momentous occasion when Gurudeva's finite form was removed from our gaze, there is no diminution in, of his guidance and personal aid to devotees who strive to remain in tune with him amidst the uncertainties of this ever-changing world. What greater comfort and assurance could we have then to realize that we are sheltered eternally in God through Guru's loving care? In the same letter, beloved Ma says, that blessed Guru never allowed those of us around him to become dependent upon outward association, insisting that we learn soul attunement with him by which we could receive the supreme spiritual treasures he was sent to bestow. Through faithful, devoted inner communion in meditation and by daily looking to his teachings for enlightening and encouraging motivation in facing all of life's experiences, each disciple can have the divine companionship with Gurudev. Now I'll tell you a story. Millenniums ago, there was a saint who invented a method to produce fire. He wanted to share the knowledge with others. So he went to a tribe and demonstrated the method. He explained the uses of fire, like lightning, lighting, cooking, etc. The tribal community showered him with praise and gratitude. Later, they built a temple in his honor, installed a statue, worshipped him. 
and passed on their reverence to their children, next generation also. But in the process, they forgot all about the fire. How to produce and the benefits of fire, they forgot. The saint approached another tribe and demonstrated the method of producing the fire. He explained the uses, like same thing, lighting, cooking, etc. Those people grabbed the information with a great interest and started making and using the fire in their daily lives. But they completely forgot about the saint and his contribution to their lives. They were not worshipping him, but they were using the fire. Now, what will you say? Is the saint pleased with the tribe who worshipped him and forgot all about fire? Or the tribe who forgot about him and made use of the fire? Who listened to the saint? <laughs> so this story nicely illustrates to us what is required is we have to listen to the Guru. We have to leave the teachings. We have to follow what the Guru says. <laughs> Not just only give him worship and then do whatever we want. <laughs> then the ego just continues to you know, rule our lives. We want to surrender the ego. Let the Guru guide our lives. We have to follow his teachings, not what we feel like doing. <laughs> so if we do that way, then we get proper attunement with the Guru. This is so beautifully explained by Bhagavan Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. Che number adhyayas, fourth, fourth chapter, 34th sloka. Tad vidhi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya upadekshanti te jnanam jnaninas tattva darshina. Here, so beautifully he gives three methods how we can attune with the Guru. So this doesn't require his physical presence. We can attune with the Guru by these methods. What are those methods? One is Pranipad, self-surrender, completely surrendering to the Guru. Let the Guru guide our lives completely in all levels, physical level, mental level, intellectual level, emotional level, spiritual level, all the levels you just surrender to the Guru completely. That is a complete surrender. This method also, once you surrender like that, we empty ourselves, then Guru can fill us completely with the Divine Consciousness. When this I shall die, then I will know who I am. <laughs> so this principle is the Pranipad, that is self-surrender. Second method is intelligent questions, Pariprashna. Questioning not to show that I, I know more than the Guru. <laughs> it is the attitude of Vinambarata, humility. We ask the Guru, I am not able to understand this. Please explain to me why. You know, when you ask in that way with reverence and humility, and we get attunement with the Guru. This is second. Third is by Seva, service, which I see so beautifully represented here by all of you. Yesterday I saw the movie, video. I was so touched in the heart to see the drinking water project. Prema Amrita Dhara, that beautiful name also, it beautifully illustrates that. So, this way, surely, the Bhagavan will live in our hearts. The followers can have the guiding, ever-living presence of that Bhagavan continue, will continue, if we do what he asked us to do. In all the great gurus, when they tell us what, they, what, we, knew, what we need to do, so we should just continue to do that. So, you see, Krishna himself has told us these three wonderful methods of attuning, which we can all do. Every day we can practice that. So if you do that, then the living presence of the Guru never will leave us. It will continue to guide us throughout this life till the last moment. And even after that beyond, after the transition to the other world, still the Guru will continue to guide us. He will not leave us at all. Because Guru is omnipresent, he is omnipotent, he is present everywhere. There is no past, present, future for him. There is no time and space. He is there everywhere. <laughs> And in this stanza, explaining this, Param Yogananji gives one very practical advice what we can do to attune with the Guru. Yeah, supposing we want to find some solution to a problem or we want some guidance, we want some understanding. What do we do? First, you sit quietly, meditate for a while. Become calm, become quiet. Then, concentrate at the Kutastha, Brumadhyaya. And visualize the Guru being present there. And then, in a humility, spirit of humility, you ask the question which you have. 
what shall I do now? How shall I proceed? And invariably you will find the increasing, accruing inner perceptions through that you will get the guidance, what is to be done. So each one of us can have personal guidance of the great ones in this way by our own attunement, by becoming calm, by becoming peaceful, by asking the question, by asking for guidance in humility and waiting to hear the answer also. What is the problem? We talk to someone, we talk to someone. उनसे फोन कॉल कर दिया हेलो हेलो बोला वो जब फोन उठाया हम लोग को तुरंत हमारा फोन को रख दिया सपोज वी डू लाइक दैट वी जस्ट कॉल समबडी एंड देन व्हेन द अदर पर्सन पिक्स अप द फोन वी जस्ट पुट द फोन डाउन देन व्हाट व्हाट वाज द पॉइंट इन कॉलिंग दैट पर्सन सिमिलरली व्हेन वी मेडिटेट व्हेन वी डू वर्शिप वी आर एड्रेसिंग टू गॉड वी आर एक्सप्रेसिंग व्हाट वी वांट टू कन्वे आवर डिवोशन आवर लव आवर नीड फॉर गाइडेंस एवरीथिंग वी एक्सप्रेस but then, immediately just we get up and go. <laughs> we are not listening. We should listen to the Guru. We should wait patiently. Just remain in the Kutastha. Be calm. Then you see, as you listen, the guidance starts coming. That is why it's very important every day, spend some time in meditation. In addition to the worship we do, in the sadhana, you add the meditation also, two times daily sit for some time in whatever way you like the way you have been taught you follow that it doesn't matter whichever method you follow we follow in yoga the, the kriya yoga method we have some definite method you also have similarly taught by your gurus different method whatever method you have taken follow that and then meditate and get that attunement now to illustrate it is not only restricted only to saints from india saints are there all over the globe because god is one he is representing in various forms and various colors and various races. For example, Saint Francis, he lived several centuries after Jesus Christ left the body. Similarly, Saint Teresa of Avila, she lived after several centuries after Jesus Christ left the body. But they had such beautiful attunement. They lived the life. They demonstrate, they showed by their lives demands are that uh, real teachings of Jesus Christ. Similarly, are not millions inspired by Gyaneshwar, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, and all these great saints, same way now our Bhagavan Satya Sai Baba also will continue to guide millions. Because for them, physical body, just leaving the physical body doesn't mean anything at all. <laughs> and the guru of our Paramahamsa Yogananda, Swami Sri Yukteswarji, we have a small temple at Sarampur, which is about 10 kilometers from Calcutta. That is where Yukteswarji had trained Paramahams Yogananda for the worldwide mission. Yukteswarji has written a small book called Holy Science, Kaivalya Darshanam. In case you are able to read that, I would you know, recommend. There, in a very short book, he describes the whole process, how the creation has come about, what is the purpose of life, and how through attunement with the Guru, we can achieve that, the procedure to be followed, and the vibhutis and the steps which show us that we are making progress. Four steps he has divided in that book. In that book, Holy Science, Yukteswarji says, to keep company with the Guru is not only to be in his physical presence, as it is impossible sometimes. For us all, it is impossible. <laughs> but mainly means to keep him in our hearts, and be one with him in principle and to attune ourselves with him. Three points. Keep him in our hearts first. Enshrine him in the hearts. And then be one with him in principle. That means you understand the teachings and make it part of your consciousness. Thorough understanding. By deep study, swadhyay, you just understand the teachings clearly and then make it part of your life part of your consciousness. Third is attune ourselves. As we said, how to attune through service, by questioning, by surrender. In that way, we can get attunement. You see then, it is possible for all of us, isn't it? It is not difficult to do. All of us can do that. Though Baba is not in physical form, our attunement with Him, there is no limitation for that. We can still continue to do that. In this way, enshrining in our hearts, being one with him in principle and to be in tune with him. 
So to keep company with the godlike object is to associate him with Shraddha, the heart's love intensified. And keeping his appearance and attributes fully in mind and by reflecting on the same and affectionately following his instructions, lamb-like, faithfully following the instructions. So in that way, then we have attunement with the Guru. So that is why when somebody tells, ask the question, is it necessary to be in the physical presence of your Guru to receive the guidance? Now, after listening to all of that, it's more or less, I mean, it will be very clear to us, it is not so. Because the Guru is omnipresent. His help, his guidance, and his teachings prevail not only for the brief years he dwells on earth, but forever. The Guru's help to sincere followers does not cease when he leaves the body. If it did, he is not a true Guru. Because God is omnipresent, so the Guru is also omnipresent. So one monk, he read autobiography before joining the ashram. He became serious about spiritual life, but he was not sure whom to follow. He met one Indian Swamiji. He was in America. Indian Swamiji had gone there. He met him and told him, can he be his guru? He asked him. He already told him his background. He has read autobiography and he very much felt attunement with the teachings. But he asked this, thinking that physical presence of the guru is necessary. That's why he asked this question, will he be the guru? Then the Swamiji replied to him, no, Paramahamsa Yogananda is your guru. Then the devotee replied, but he is dead. He is no longer there. How can I follow him? Then very nicely the Swamiji replied, no, Yoganandji is not dead. You are dead. <laughs> so that illustrates so beautifully. That means the guru is always there. He is omnipresent. His guidance is always there. We are dead because we are not attuned to the guru. We think in that way, limited way, that he has to be physically present, we have to go there and physical form, we have to worship, then only, you know, we can get the blessings of the Guru. But it is not so. That's why, now I'll come to the last portion. How Guru, the tribute to the Guru by Saint Kabir. Kabir had said this about Guru. It is the mercy of the true Guru that has made me to know the unknown. I have learned from him how to walk without feet, how to see without eyes, how to hear without ears, how to drink without mouth, how to fly without wings. <laughs> they sound very strange, isn't it? Guru helps us to do that. Like that, just like Mukam Karoti Vachalam Pangulangete Girim, Yat Kripa Tamaham Vande Paramananda Madhavam. There we have exactly the same principle. I have brought my love and my meditation into the land where there is no sun, no moon, nor day and night. Without eating, I have tasted the sweetness of nectar. And without water, I have quenched my thirst. Where there is the response of delight, there is the fullness of joy. Before whom can that joy be uttered? Kabir says, the Guru is great beyond words, and great is the good fortune of the disciple. So we see, we are all very fortunate to have this great avatars coming to the earth in order to help us, in order to show us the way and continue to show us the way even after they leave the physical form. So let us be grateful, let us express our heartfelt thanks and dedicate ourselves during this one year Mahasamadhi. I will tell you one more story because this is very exactly similar to what we are facing now. One of the direct disciples of Param Yogananda, Swami Ananda Mai. He was from Switzerland. He was he had studied with the world famous architect Frank Lloyd Wright. But then he found that his purpose of life was not to become an architect. He left that and then joined the ashram, came under Param Yogananda. So after Param Yogananda entered Mahasamadhi in 1952. His body was enshrined in Forest Lawn Memorial in Los Angeles. So one year after that, he visited, made a pilgrimage to that spot to pay homage to the Guru. Then as he was standing there and meditating, he started feeling the presence of the Guru 
shining. That glorious presence was felt. He felt the light and joy and the Guruji was so much very tangibly present. But then he realized that experience was not coming from the form. It was coming from his heart. It was coming from inside, not from the form. Then he understood. Guruji is giving him the message. You don't have to come and see my form to feel my presence, to feel the blessings. If you go inside and you have devotion, you have Shraddha, then you will feel the presence inside. So that's so beautiful, isn't it? That is how Anandamayaji explained. Anandamayaji tells one more story also. It's very interesting. Whenever he would meditate, he said, I will never meditate alone. Kabhi bhi akela mein dhyan nahi karta hun. Guruji ka sangati mein dhyan karta hun. Guruji ka company mein rata hun. I mean, I always sit in Guruji's presence, in his company. I visualize Guruji being present here. When I start the meditation, feel that he is with me. He was doing that for a while. Then, at that time, Guruji was still in physical form. He was in a place called our Hollywood. Hollywood, there is an ashram. That's where he was staying, serving Guruji. So he used to meditate upstairs. He used to climb the stairs and small room upstairs. That's where he used to go and meditate. One day when he went there, Guruji was in the ashram at that time. As he was meditating, suddenly he heard footsteps coming. Then he became very happy, delighted. Oh, Guruji is coming. Guruji is coming to me now. So his meditation became so deep. He could feel so much of joy. He didn't open the eyes. He continued to enjoy that. After finishing the meditation, he opened the eyes and he was thinking that he would see the Guru sitting next to him. It was not the Guru, it was a dog. <laughs> a dog had climbed the stairs and came here and sat, sat next to him. So this shows very dramatically the thought of Guruji being present is more important than Guruji actually physically being present. <laughs> that is the most important thing. That visualization or the feeling, bhav, that Guruji is with me. And when that visualization is there, then Guruji's presence is very much there, you feel that. So this story very really nicely illustrates that. That means to attune with the Guru, then what is necessary is three, three things we have to remember, from the heart, from the mind, and also with our hands, all the three. Like we started with the prayer, so beautifully given by Guruji, with God in your hearts, enshrine God in your hearts, with a smile on your face, always cheerful, Yesterday, I was so happy to see when they were addressing you with so much of spirit, so much of enthusiasm among all the volunteers, among all the trustees and everyone. That's so beautiful. That is how the work will surely go on in that way. When we carry on in that way with spirit, with enthusiasm, there will be no death. So with God in your heart, with a smile on your face, let your hands work ungrudgingly for truth alone. That means you have to work hard. Parisham karna padega, seva karna padega. We cannot just keep quiet, just saying that God will do everything. We have to do our part. We have to serve. So if we do that, then I think our purpose will be served. I thank all of you for this opportunity that I could come down and join with you all and be with you in this. Master. May I request you to again fold your hands. Let us close with a prarthana, with a prayer. Beloved God, may thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of my devotion. And may I be able to awaken thy love in all hearts. Om Shanti 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 Shanti, Shanti. Shanti.